explicitly, visually, verbally, manifestly saturated with the Bible because there's the authority, the power, the life. Human words accomplish nothing if they're not clearly echoing God's truth. He has the power, we don't. It's the inspired word of God. John is the book. Now, that phrase, word of God, takes us now to our text. So, I hope you will wear out your Bible by opening to John chapter 1. And we're only going to look at verses 1 through 3 in this message. So, uh, we won't go at this pace, probably, through the whole book. Um, At least, I don't think I could live that long. But there are portions of it which must, especially at the beginning here. I think the pace will quicken, lest we become repetitive, because this is a very repetitive book. It's like a bee buzzing around a flower. And there's only one flower, and he sees it here, he sees it here, he sees it here, he sees it here. So we can unpack it densely at the beginning, then later we will probably be able to move more quickly. Let's read these three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Let's focus first on the term word. In the beginning was the word. Of all the things that could be said about the word, here's the most important. I say it without fear of contradiction. The most important thing you must know about the Word is given in verse 14. And the Word became flesh. That is the most important thing that you can know about this Word. There are other supremely important things, but if you miss this one, you'll miss John's angle on it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. The Word is the Son, full of grace and truth. So the Word refers to Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, the fleshed, fleshed, human nature, Son of God. Now, John knows what he's about to do. He's lived a long time thinking about what was so hard for him to grasp during the life of Jesus. And he's lived a long time, and now he's going to write this story. He knows Jesus was a man. He leaned his head on his shoulder. And he's going to tell us story after story of what he did as a man on the earth. He knows where he's going, his life, his work. He saw him, he heard him, he touched him. That's what he says in, in his first epistle. We touched him. He stresses it with his hands. Flesh and blood, not a ghost, not an apparition, like, who shows up, appears and vanishes. He ate, he drank, he got tired. He was sitting on the well in chapter 4, tired and hungry. John knew him very closely. Jesus' mother lived with John. From the day Jesus died till the day John died. That was a... Well, today, till the day Mary died, probably. She probably died first. We don't know. 
think of it. He could ask her anything. He knew him so well. He knows where he's going. He's going to tell this story about this man. So what he's doing in verses 1 to 3 is not as though he's beginning here. We're beginning here. He's not beginning here. He, he didn't get that for three years. He's beginning here where he wants us to begin. He's, he's saying the most ultimate things about Jesus Christ he could possibly say at the beginning of his story. And then he says in verse 14, pretty quickly, that's the one who became flesh. That's the one I put my, my hand on his side and laid my head on his shoulder. So John clearly doesn't want us to go through what he went through. He and the others fumbled the ball so many times during those three years trying to figure out who it is that could command the wind and the waves and drive out demons and heal leprosy and raise the dead. Who is this? And even at the last, when they were running into the tomb, John got it first and Peter didn't get it. This was slow in coming. Who is this? And he doesn't want us to go through that. That struck me. First words out of his mouth in writing is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what I'm talking about. Isn't that amazing? Well, what do we draw from that? Well, one thing I draw from that is, he means for us to read this gospel stunned. He means for us to read this gospel worshipfully. It's not wrong to write a story with suspense. This one just doesn't have any. At least not with regard to the identity of the main character. Just get it clear from the beginning. We're talking about God. Amazing. Didn't have to do it that way. Could have done it legitimately another way. But he's saying, I want you to know that this Jesus made you. As you read, think, he made me like a potter makes a pot. Only more because he also invents the clay. He wants us to know this immediately. Feel it. He wants us at the beginning of this sermon series to be absolutely blown away by what he says here. To our mouths to drop open that he could say these things about a crucified apparent criminal. He just wants us to be worshipful. So, John says, uh, no, we're not going to go the route of sneaking up on the identity of Jesus. That's the way I walked, but you're not going to walk that way in my gospel. Very first words out of the end of his pen are supposed to stun you, blow you away in the identity of this man who became flesh and dwelt among us. Let there be no mistaking. John means us to read every word of this gospel with a clear, solid, amazed knowledge that Jesus was with God and was God before the world was and that he made everything, created the universe. He wants you to have a magnificent Savior. He wants your Savior to be really big. For whatever else you love about Jesus, his tenderness, his meekness, his kindness, his patience, John wants you to be blown away so that all of that 
is inside something absolutely huge.